Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Chalenza, and I'm the James B. Knapp Dean of the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences at Johns Hopkins University. I want to welcome you to Conversations on Slavery, Racism, and the University, an event hosted by the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences and the Hopkins Retrospective. National histories are complicated things, especially so in the decentralized educational environment of the United States. So like much else in the United States, the understanding of their own history that Americans possess is heterogeneous, somewhat more so I think than in other countries. And the progress of the field of American history has been guided by the interpretations of leading scholars generation by generation. And so it is that in the United States, we have habitually learned the date 1776 as a key marker in US history with a lot less focus on the date 1619. The first date represents the moment when the Second Continental Congress endorsed those ringing words in the Declaration of Independence that, quote, all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with unalienable rights, the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The second date, 1619, is the year that a ship brought to the state of Virginia more than 20 enslaved Africans who were sold to the colonists. As the institution of slavery grew, those people who were enslaved did not possess those rights that the Declaration of Independence suggested were the unalienable property of, quote, all men, a designation with which those colonists intended in some regard to point to humanity at large, nor for that matter did women possess those rights. All of the troublesome contradictions present in US culture can be seen through the counterpositioning of those dates. The fact that anyone who becomes a citizen from anywhere or any social station has the right to thrive in the United States versus the fact that the color of people's skin can hold them back even in environments that consider themselves to be enlightened. The fact that a society that is now supposed to be blind to race, gender, and class regularly sees examples of those categories coming together to produce radical inequities. And the fact that what Soika Colbert and Robert Patterson have called the psychic hold of slavery still lingers among Americans of African descent. These contradictions remain. They do not vitiate the ideals that animated the declaration. In this case, the ideal is that of equal opportunity to flourish for all human beings. If we have a long way to go, it does not mean that the journey is not worth traveling. It means instead that we need to disentangle the knots in which those contradictions are embedded. One place where these seemingly Gordian knots present themselves is in the history of US universities. Since Craig Stephen Wilder's brilliant book, Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of America's Universities, we've known that a number of US universities were either founded by slaveholders or benefited by them, or were in some way connected to the institution of slavery. In the wake of that book and other contemporary projects, a number of universities and colleges began researching their own history to see when and how they might have been connected to slavery and racism in their own institutional histories. There's now a group of about 70 of these institutions of which Johns Hopkins University is a member. And as a member institution, we've committed to telling our institution's history in full. I should note that given that we came late to this kind of work, we can say that we have just begun. Part of this lateness has to do with the structure of the university, which historically has been decentralized to a great degree. However, with the leadership and under the presidency of Ron Daniels, we've made great strides in thinking of ourselves as one university. And so though we may have come late to the writing of a comprehensive institutional history in general and attending to our connections to slavery and institutional racism in particular, we've now entered into these fields with energy. Two projects deserve to be highlighted. First, there is the Hard Histories Project led by our wonderful multiple award-winning historian, Martha Jones, the Society of Black Alumni Professor at Johns Hopkins University. Hard Histories examines the role that racism and discrimination have played at Johns Hopkins. From seminars with undergraduate students to graduate initiatives to faculty work, Hard Histories represents a buzzing hive of activity, all toward the end of continuing the work into the ways that our university's history had touch points with slavery and racism. Second, there is the Hopkins Retrospective Project designed to look at our university's history in all of its dimensions. This event today forms part of a suite of events and research projects that seek to deepen our, our knowledge along the lines sketched above. 
The intention behind today's symposium was threefold. We begin with general questions of method. How do professional academic historians today handle the sorts of evidence that can come up in the study of slavery? Second, we address work on universities in slavery, including work on Johns Hopkins University and its founder. Third, we want to look forward to see where this work is going, thus setting the stage for future ongoing scholarship on our own university and its connections to slavery and racism. In the mix, we seek to contribute to the national and international conversation on this topic. Ultimately, my hope is that this seminar will play a key role in building a community of scholars who are doing this work, sharing their findings and idea, ideas, and asking deep questions. Let me close by, ask, by thanking all of our participants for taking part in this event today. I am truly, truly grateful that you're sharing your work and your scholarship with us. And I'd like to give special thanks also to Allison Seiler, public historian and the program manager of the Hopkins Retrospective, and my colleague, Dr. Bess Vincent, the Associate Dean for Strategic Initiatives in the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences. I look forward to future conversations like this one. Thank you to all and to our viewers. I wish you a, I wish you a rich and fruitful day of learning um, and thought-provoking content. Welcome and um, glad, glad that you can be here joining us virtually um, this afternoon. It looks like it's gonna be a really um, amazing and kind of stimulating afternoon ahead. Um, I'm Sarah Pearsall. I'm a new professor of history here at Johns Hopkins. I recently arrived here from Cambridge University where I was on the university committee for um, examining that university's legacies of slavery. Um, I am really glad that this work is ongoing already here at Hopkins, and I'm glad to be moderating this panel today. Um, we'll be hearing remarks today from panelists about the methodologies that they use to approach the difficult topics of slavery, racism, and the university as well. Our speakers will be exploring comparative experiences, discussing their findings, and the challenges of the archival research that they all do, and sharing insights about um, sort of best practice and questions and methods for doing this kind of challenging but vital work. I will briefly introduce our panelists before they speak. And first we'll be hearing from Dr. Jessica Marie Johnson. She is an assistant professor in the Department of History here at Johns Hopkins University. She's also the Director of Life X Code, Digital Humanities Against Enclosure. She's a historian of Atlantic slavery and the Atlantic African diaspora, as well as the author of the um, prize, multiple prize winning Wicked Flesh, Black Women, Intimacy and Freedom in the Atlantic World. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Johnson. I am really thrilled to be here. Um, this is such an important topic. Thank you um, to Dean Chalenza for the invitation and Allison, I'm sorry for all the work that has been happening behind the scenes in order to make this event happen. Um, and I'm going to start out by um, just sort of acknowledging the amazing, um, really tremendous research that Dr. Martha Jones has been leading um, as part of hard histories, um, as a leader, our fearless leader in hard histories, um, and the work of my colleagues. Um, it's a tremendous honor to be in a in a department that so much centers Black historical thoughts and the views of Africans, people of African descent, um, in historical practice. Um, I am. Um, uh, really emboldened by um, the uh, analysis 
um, that Dr. Jones has has offered. Um, I just want to say with with no um, equivocation that it is clear from their research that Johns Hopkins um, was absolutely benefiting from slavery. Um, we can describe him as an enslaver. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to thinking about what it means when we try to obfuscate um, the evidence in front of us. And what's fascinating is that enslaved people also understood it um, that way. Um, one of my favorite quotes um, is uh, James W. C. Pennington, um, who was enslaved in Maryland, um, and where he describes, as enslaved people did, their understandings and their theorization of what slavery was, um, and who notes that um, his feelings are always outraged when I hear them speak of kind masters or um, well-clothed, well-fed and clothed slaves, um, as though somehow that mitigates slavery. Um, and he's very clear that the being of slavery, its soul and body lives and moves in the chattel principle. It's the property principle, it's the bill of sale, it's the cart whip, it's starvation, it's nakedness, bondage um, for enslaved people. These are bondage. Um, and there's something really important here in centering that. And so that's what I'm gonna do here, um, because particularly in, in relation to my work on women and gender, on, on intimate um, and intimate kinship practices of, of African women, women it's really clear is that there are ways that same obfuscation of the sources of the facts happens when it comes to thinking about sexual violence and also the kind of um, um, kinship practices um, that are presumed between slave owners and slaves, between master and, and subject, um, so that the um, mildest form of slavery, as Pennington goes on, um, is still part of the same principle. Um, it's still part of the ways that enslaved understood their um, their bondage. The interesting part of Pennington's analysis for me um, are the ways that he actually goes on to use as his example of how the mildest form of slavery is also still slavery, um, the experiences of, of enslaved women. Um, he goes on to talk about how there are no mothers um, who rear and educate in the natural graces finer daughters than the Ethiopian women who have the least chance to give scope to their maternal affections. But what is generally the fate of such female slaves when they are not raised for the express purpose of supplying um, the market of a class of economical um, Louisiana and Mississippi gentlemen. So my work is on Louisiana, so I find it interesting to, um, to think about that as a focus. Um, so he's using intimate violence and the intimate space and geography of the household as his example of the ways that slavery is sort of um, in this era, you know, pitched as not so bad because we're so kind to our subjects and our, our, the people in our household, but actually is um, incredibly devastating. Um, I come to this um, to think in terms of methodology and just pause for a second. Um, I come to Pennington's quote through the work of, of Walter Johnson um, and others in this incredible book. And I thought it was worth showing it, not just to kind of think about the kind of text that we have for understanding things like domestic slave trade, things like slavery and slavery in a household, but also to note that um, the, um, the cover of the book uh, is a portrait of Renty, um, which was taken um, as part of a study of uh, biological differences between the races. It is a force image. Um, and it also is actually part of this conversation on slavery and university um, that we're having. Um, right now, Tamara Lanier um, is um, in the midst of a lawsuit against Harvard who holds the images of Renty as well as his daughter Delia and others. Um, and she is a descendant of them. So there's a lot of ways that um, slavery in the university is actually very much part of this conversation. But to come back um, to Pennington, one of the um, stories that Pennington tells pretty immediately is of his owner, because um, remember, and remembering he's enslaved in Maryland. Um, so um, his Maryland slave owner um, who owned a beautiful girl about 24. She'd been raised in a family. She's a favorite. Um, she was her mother's darling child. Um, her master was a lawyer. 
eminent abilities and great fame. Um, after he owned her about a year, one of his sons became attached to her for, quote, no honorable, was not well known, but which became a source of unhappiness to his mother and sister. So this is all, this is all um, Pennington discussing this um, in, his, um, in his narrative. Um, and she ends up being sold to Georgia. Um, so I want to think about this, this piece of um, what is well known among those who are enslaved, among Black people, about what the state of bondage is, about these intimate practices. Um, and also um, think about how that is also part of how we might center Black views of bondage. Um, and this project of no exceptions to all parties in, um, in slaveholding households. Um, so whether it's the uh, slave owner um, and his male um, or his wife or other mistresses um, we have a quote here from Dr. Tavoli Glimp um, talking about the ways that uh, female slave owners and wives of slave owners um, were also no exceptions. We're also part of the terror and heart of slavery that resided in this intimate um, and you know um, pretended paternal relations between masters and slaves, black and white. Um, the really most powerful work, um, again, thinking of methodologies and texts we might take away from this panel on enslaved and domestic work. Um, this is a category of labor that tends to be gendered as female, as we'll, we'll talk about it more in a moment, um, but also was very much in the shadow of mistresses who used a whole array of violences um, to keep their enslaved property um, in line. And so um, some examples from Glimp's work are um, a woman, enslaved woman, Mary Armstrong, her nine-month-old sister is killed by her mistress because she was tired of hearing it cry. Henry Walton's mother was whipped to death with a cowhide when he was three or four years old. Molly Kinsey's sister, as a small girl, is made to go out and lay on a table and two or three white men would have intercourse with her before they'd let her get up. These are just fragments of the stories that are discussed and told among enslaved people. These are Black views of bondage. Um, and they are very much giving us a lens into what is truly at the heart of the slave trade, slave trades, the property principle, the chattel principle, however we might want to describe it. Um, Ed Baptist has an amazing article um, in which um, award-winning Ed Baptist for a half has never been told. Before he wrote that, um, he also wrote about the ways that from jailers to mistresses to banks at Wall Street, um, all of these um, parts of, of slavery and the slave trade um, are reek of, of sexual violence. Um, in the time that I have left, I wanna try and bring this very much directly to um, the university that we are um, speaking of. Um, and the story of Chariot Castle, which is reflected in the site of Homewood's campus. Um, and is this is actually an exhibit here up from the Homewood Museum, um, curated by Julie Rose, uh, with the assistance of, a, of an array of, of JHU undergraduate students who are doing tremendous research, sort of like how hard history is doing right now. Uh, so uh, Homewood um, House um, is the home of Charles Carroll Jr., the son of Charles Carroll, the signer of the Declaration of Independence, very much a slave owner. Um, and we have a picture of this here. Uh, and uh, he's married to Harriet Chu Carroll. He's also home um, to his wife. Um, and as it turns out, um, um, physically and sexually abusive to um, one of his enslaved um, members of this household. Uh, Charity Castle. Um, so much so that Harriet Chu leaves and it, uh, it departs to Philadelphia to get away from her husband. And just as an example, just um, that photo there is not uh, a photo of uh, Charity Castle. We don't have a photo of her, but it is a photo of Annie Addison. Again, this is the curatorial work that um, scholars of, of, of slavery and history are trying to do even in museum spaces. Um, this was the image that is being used. Uh, also in the vein of sort of trying to fill part of the including uh, what um, artist Carol Walker, um, and this is the one that was paired with um, the Chariot um, exhibit curated by, um, by undergraduate students here. 
So quickly to come back to Charity Castle. So Charity Castle um, uh, is, and she's doing in the midst of um, various abolitionist organizing, um, including in 1780, uh, about 30 years before um, an act for gradual abolition of slavery was passed. Now this becomes really critically important in, a in an array of stories, including since Adam Rothman will be appearing with us later on, um, the story of another um, enslaved woman who had a lot to say through her movements and her absconding about slavery. Um, Eric Armstrong Dunbar's work on Ona Judge, um, who ran away from George Washington and was pr pursued across straight lines um, for most of her life by him. Uh, so we can also see the silhouette again becoming part of curatorial practice where we don't have images. This silhouette is um, on the Mount Vernon Museum website as well as I believe represented in person um, and is based on details, but again, things that we don't know are as important as, um, as the things that we do. So, uh, um, and when she is about to be sent back to Baltimore, um, because part of the um, Act for Gradual Abolition in 1780 in Philadelphia is that enslaved people could only be in Philadelphia for six months. Um, otherwise, their enslavers had to summon them back a slave state six months and is back. Um, she expresses, makes um, declarations, um, many excuses, and finally brings forth a tale um, which has so shocked um, my poor sister, this is Benjamin Chu speaking, um, that she was chiefly in her chamber and has suffered a conflict, it's not easy to be described to you, leaving her in doubt what part to adopt, even mentioning to me. Um, Benjamin Chu continues essentially that it would be improper to send Charity Castle back. Um, it would be improper to place her at Homewood, where attempts have been essayed that delicacy forbids me to particularize. So Benjamin Chu, is speaking of the sexual violence that uh, Charles Carroll is enacting on his enslaved um, property um, on Charity Castle. Um, and he is, in some ways, might be described by, um, as a result of this, as a kind master. Um, or maybe he was being problematic. Um, but he wasn't an abolitionist, which is what's also interesting. He doesn't ask for Charity's emancipation, um, which he could do, particularly out of the Philadelphia Context, and he doesn't sort of, you know, around the timeline and sort of, you know, six months lag so that she would then legally be free, quite aware of as time passes. Um, no, he instead he asked Charles Carroll's father for an exchange of property for another woman to take Charity Castle's place to allow a property that is enslaved, that his sister coveted, to remain with him. Um, he asked specifically. Um, for um, for another woman um, in charity stead to be sent to Holmwood. Uh, in the end, uh, charity uh, does not go back to Homewood and not because Charles Carroll answers Charles Carroll Senior. Um, she doesn't. She suffers an accident. Um, this accident forces her to avoid being sent back to um, to Baltimore, um, and it's it's. Presumably a graphic accident. One might she, uh, 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 it, it's impossible to say whether she staged her accident because it is fairly graphic. Um, she's unconscious for 20 minutes. She, you know, bled, she was bled per medical practice. Um, she is essentially unable to, unable to go on horseback back to Baltimore. Um, but it's worth thinking about what are the ways that her story also offers a context in which we can see other kinds of uh, other kinds of violences. So we have Harriet Jacobs here um, speaking to the ways that um, uh, her mistress also would be party to um, uh, harassing her uh, inappropriately while she was in bed, um, as well as between uh, Luke, who is another new person. To come back to Charity Castle, um, Charles Carroll. Um, as Charity is sort of convalescing, um, still unable to travel, sort of kind of weighs in. Um, he says, um, yeah, it's probably not a good idea. Do write a letter to, um, to him, directing him not to take Charity to my home, to my home way, but to leave her at your house. So even Carol is sure, he's aware that there's a kind of sexual violence happening, a physical violence happening. Um, also does not suggest um, emancipation. So again, this kind of no exceptions um, piece of our story. 
um, that is so, so important. Now things have an interesting twist. You have, um, because in Philadelphia, a man named William Lewis um, begins to appear in this story, um, in this documentation. Um, and William Lewis essentially um, says that well, since Charity never made it to William Wilmington um, and never made it back to Baltimore, um, she is technically free um, by this law. Um, and as you can imagine, Benjamin Chu, um, Harriet, um, her mistress, uh, Charles Carroll, all have some interesting things to say about this. Again, as we've seen, there at no point have decided that emancipation is in charity's future, despite what they clearly know is happening as far as violence. Um, but interesting for us, I just kind of want to kind of pull back from that, those debates to come back to this kind of um, Black views of bondage, when it becomes clear that Charity will be sent back to Baltimore and presumably to slavery again, um, now that she's better, um, she says she doesn't want to return to Maryland, but that she would speak to her husband. Um, and then Charity's husband visits the Jews, and he becomes clear that actually he has commissioned the assistance of a lawyer and the assistance of legal authority. Somehow, which as historians know, is not unusual that rumors of um, Harriet, uh, Charity Castle and her husband um, have worked to try and find some navigation out of bondage for her into some kind of safe space um, and some, um, some, some kinship space beyond this chattel principle. It's not entirely clear what happens to Charity. Um, Charles Carroll Sr., um, Benjamin Chu, William Lewis have a kind of back and forth in these documents very much about whose property um, is Charity, is the law, the abolition of law, does that apply? Um, Charles Carroll Jr. himself even weighs in. He says, I care not what becomes of the unhappy wretch. What I'm interested in here, as well as in thinking about the ways that households are very much part of uh, this system of bondage and that the intimate violence of slavery is actually maybe a place where we need to start, is that um, while Charles Carroll Jr. is saying, I cared not, and is already making plans to sell charity to Georgia, um, what we also see are charity and her husband having a different kind of care um, and a different kind of analysis of what bondage is. And what would it mean if we started there when we're thinking about how we approach these documents, how we approach the archive and the methods, um, and what we're actually supposed to learn about something like our university's relationship to the cities that they're in and the histories of slavery in places like Baltimore. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Um, so much to think about and also to, to look at and consider there. Um, moving on, I would like to um, briefly introduce uh, Dr. Sasha Turner, who's an associate professor of history at Johns Hopkins, uh, a historian of the Caribbean. Her research focuses on colonialism and enslavement and the period of slavery in particular. She's especially interested in understanding the lives of women and children who navigated racial and gendered subjectivity, some of the same things addressed by Dr. Johnson. So thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Purcell. Um, so I'll start my remarks uh, by bringing to memory a tweet from Her Majesty's Treasury in February 2018. Quote, did you know in 1833, Britain used 20 million pounds, 40% of its national budget to buy freedom for all slaves in the empire? The amount of money borrowed for the Slavery Abolition Act was so large, it wasn't paid off until 2015, which means that living British citizens helped pay to end the slave trade, end quote. The wineskin was new, but the wine was already well-aged, a classic. As early as 1808, the very same year the Slave Trade Abolition Act took effect, British mythmakers went to work using the abolition of the slave trade and slavery to prop up British national image. The earliest historian of abolition, Thomas Clarkson, also an abolitionist, 
drew upon the moral arguments activists deployed in condemning the slaving system to redefine the act of abolition as a most humanitarian endeavor, reflecting the British nation's long-standing commitment to freedom. How ironic. Until the mid 20th century challenge initiated by historian Eric Williams, popular and historical interpretations of abolition celebrated British humanitarianism and benevolence. Abolitionists like William Wilberforce and James Ramsey became martyrs for the cause, having doggedly pursued the cause of abolition for over three centuries, even in the face of bitter recrimination and personal assault. The celebration of British virtue and its virtuous men effectively erased slavery and the principal role the British played as enslavers and slave traders. Sitting at the feet of mounted images of William Wilberforce in colonial classrooms in colonies like Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago, Black supplicants were taught to celebrate Great Britain, patron of Black freedom. What does British abolition have to do with Hopkins and slavery? A lot as it turns out. Before the December 9, 2020 announcement of the Hopkins family relationship to slavery, Hopkins, much like Britain, had been portrayed as, quote, a staunch abolitionist, and much like the British tweet that reminded Black people that they owed their freedom to British taxpayers, newspaper publications celebrated Johns Hopkins' commitment to Black freedom by noting his lifelong anti-slave reviews and his purchase of a slave just to make him free. As it turns out, there are several problems with the abolitionist identity assumed by Britain and Hopkins. For starters, focus on the moral arguments for abolition has simplified and at times stifled debate. Using such language as inhumane, immoral, and reprehensible to the principles of justice, humanity, and sound policy, Abolitionists in popular imagination are thought of as so far removed from slavery, many find it unimaginable that abolitionists could have owned slaves. A quick survey of the principal abolitionist tells a more complicated story. Abolitionist James Ramsey, an Anglican clergy who lived in Jamaica for almost two decades, owned slaves. John Newton, also a man of the cloth, applied ships to West Africa to trade in slaves. Pitting abolition and slavery as opposites and fixating on the good feelings the very term abolition evokes, sidestep the more important question of how individuals and nations came to assume an abolitionist position. In other words, what happens to our perception of the past, of nations, institutions, and individuals when we release our sentimental attachment to abolition as simply moral and examine the complicated history of how and why abolition became policy? Per historian Eric Williams, abolition became policy in England because of changes in the economy and the relations of production. Until the end of the 18th century, British West Indian planters enjoyed a protective monopoly. The British government ensured a guaranteed market for West Indian sugar by prohibiting the importation of tropical commodities from outside the empire. Before Britain's Industrial Revolution, industries with secondary interests in the West Indian sugar and slavery system supported their monopoly because of its trickle-down profits to their own industries. With the rise of industrialization, industries that previously supported the monopoly now called for free trade. Sugar refineries, for example, were no longer content with a monopoly guaranteed supply of sugar from the British West Indies. They wanted the cheapest sugar, which sometimes came from outside the British Empire. Across British industrial towns and commercial centers, the call was the same, free trade. In this instance, abolition was hardly sentimental. It was simply a business decision, a deal facilitating the industrial transformations afoot in Britain. As Eric Williams succinctly puts it, British capitalism destroyed West Indian slavery. In revisiting the history of Johns Hopkins, it is not enough to claim simple histories of him or his family as abolitionists or slaveholder. As the British case has shown, 
we must strive for a clear understanding of the particular relations between Hopkins and abolition, rather than up for the easy feel good moral story that bolsters a national and institutional image at the expense of historical veracity. That the Hopkins family's abolitionist politics was linked to Quaker roots is unsurprising. The Quakers played a central role in, a, in sustaining and initiating the first anti-slavery movements. As early as the 1760s, the Quakers at its London yearly meeting moved to disavow Quakers still engaged in the slave trade. By 1774, Quakers had progress further disavowing members who served even as executives of estates involving slaves. Friends were required to manumit slaves at their earliest opportunity and treat Blacks in their household the same as white servants. On a much larger scale, by 1783, the Quaker had issued the first abolition petition to the British House of Commons, and a decade later, they established the first anti-slavery committees and associations in the British Isles and initiated the systematic circulation of anti-slavery literature. While it is important to recognize the unpopular steps taken by the Quakers to secure freedom, it is equally important that we understand how and why they came to disavow an institution from which they had benefited and that remained an economic staple. Quaker abolitionism was neither monolithic nor static. In the last quarter of the 18th century, Quakers underwent a period of revival, part of what we've come to identify as the Great Awakening. Both in America and England, Quaker revivalists such as John Woolman appealed to friends to cleanse themselves of every taint of worldliness. Traveling ministers rebuked families they encountered for owning slaves and not leading pious lives. Personal salvation then had come to depend on Quaker rejection of slavery. Achieving absolute purity required removing the stain of slavery. So quite distinct from the secular world that opposed slavery for their economic self-interests, the moral and spiritual self-interests of the Quakers propelled them. The anti-slavery message of the Quakers was clear. Their strategies were, however, not always unified. As historian Christopher Brown tells us, subscribing wholesale and uncritically to the Quaker reputation leaves little room for the possibility of conflict or disagreement among Quakers over ends and means or the ways friends differed from each other. Differences manifested not only between Quakers in North America and England, but within each of these distinct locales. The short window of this presentation makes it impossible for me to examine the disparities among Quakers, but in the short time I have, I will explore one. My choice of disparity does not imply that this, these were the views to which the Hopkins family subscribed. I mean to suggest that it's not enough to simply claim Hopkins was a Quaker abolitionist. We must dig deeper to unravel the ethos of Hopkins and how it informed the ecology of the subsequent institution. From Christopher Brown's work that charts the long history of abolition, including the evolution of anti-slavery Quaker ethic, we learn that the views of the 1750s and 1760s were radically different from those of the 1780s and 1790s, and again by the turn of the 19th century. Early Quakers took a position of moral absolutism, declaring there's nothing either in law or doctrine that justify holding human beings in bondage. Most radically, declare, most radically declaring slavery to violate all the laws of justice, mercy, and truth, early abolitionists rejected slavery notwithstanding its material costs. While the early abolitionists took the most radical position on the slavery question, their reach was most conservative. Except for a few individuals like Anthony Benzit, Quakers did not push for systematic changes through the colonies or empire. They focused on separating themselves from the rest of society that remained entangled in slavery. As separatists, 
they sought to cleanse themselves from the sin by disavowing slavery and restoring their community's moral center while setting an example of how distinguished they were. By the 1780s, Quaker abolitionism had shifted from a focus on the self toward outward charity. Friends like Benzit insisted it was not sufficient to turn inward away from society and its corrupting practices. According to Benzit, the practice of godliness must be cultivated through the daily practice of charity. Following the Seven Years' War, American Quakers felt greater the urge for spiritual rebirth and a cleansing that extended beyond their communities to the colonies and empire as a whole. Quaker abolitionism therefore shifted from individual appeals to whole bodies. The Philadelphia meeting for sufferings, for example, sent admonitions to the Society of Friends in England lamenting the evil so derogatory to the dignity of Christianity. They called upon fellow friends to do more than withdraw and separate themselves. They called upon fellow friends to manifest their purity through their philanthropic and charitable engagement with the world, including support for abolition. Thus we see not all abolition were created equal. Abolition for industrialists secured material self-interest, while abolition for Quakers validated their spiritual sense of self. Let me wrap things up by taking us back to the present moment. In an often quoted or sometimes misquoted essay, The Case for Reparations by ta Coates, we read that the Quakers were among the earliest supporters of reparations, having made membership contingent upon compensating one's former slaves. In 1782, quote, quote uh, further notes, the Quaker Robin Pleasance emancipated his 78 slaves, granting them 350 acres and later built a school on their property and provided for their education. The individual actions of one slaveholder suggest one possibility of reparative justice. The singling out of individual slaveholding families and their temporal proximity to slavery, however, primes us to look away from the structural and the institutional while excusing the culpability of those temporarily removed from slavery, even as their generational wealth originated in slave ownership. It is no small thing that for most of the 18th century and possibly before, White's Hall Plantation, where Johns Hopkins was born, was cultivated by, enslaved, by an enslaved workforce held in bondage by the Hopkins family. Even as a self-validating impulse of individual Quakers motivated them to gradually free people over whom they claim ownership, the initial wealth generated from the forced labor of African descended people cannot be overlooked. The grossly unequal starting point of blacks and whites in America hardened over generations. Enlarged at a macro scale, the British example is again instructive. As Eric Williams summarized it, the triangular trade gave triple stimulus to British industry the Negroes were purchased with British manufacturers, transported to the plantations. They produced sugar, cotton, indigo, molasses, and other tropical products, the processing of which created new industries in England, while the maintenance of Negroes and their owners on the plantation provided another market for British industry, New England agriculture, and the Newfoundland fisheries. By 1780, there was hardly a trading or manufacturing town in England which was not in some way connected to the triangular trade or direct colonial trade. The profits obtained provided one of the main streams of that accumulation of capital in England, which financed the Industrial Revolution. To reckon with abolition then, it's to grapple with its many fault lines, resisting the tendency to see it as a trans-historical phenomenon in which benefactors encountered a mighty prejudice and simply conquered it. To seek the truth requires a willingness to recall and remember not just parts of our histories that make us feel good, proud, but perhaps more importantly, it requires that we recount the hard past we'd rather conceal.
For it is in the concealing of old wrongs that makes likely the perpetration of new wrongs, worse new wrongs presented as right. The problem of the moral climate created around abolition is that it easily becomes a tool to paper over and justify atrocities. In the case of the tweet with which I opened, it was deployed at a time of the resurgence of British nationalism and its violence toward former colonized subjects migrating to England. And before that, abolition was a means by which Europeans in the 19th century claimed trusteeship over Africa. Reconciling the past requires honest recounting of the past, including the, pa the parts we wish to conceal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Turner, for that uh, thought-provoking and fascinating discussion. Um, and I'd like to introduce our final speaker for today, um, Dr. Nathan Connolly, who's the Herbert Baxter Adams Associate Professor of History at Johns Hopkins University. He's also the Director of the Program in Racism, Immigration, and Citizenship. His scholarship deals with issues of racism, capitalism, politics, cities, and migration in the late 19th and 20th centuries. He's particularly focused on people's notions of family, property, and citizenship, both in the United States and in the wider Americas. So, Dr. Conley. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I trust folks can see things and hear, okay? Quick thumbs up, okay. Funny things can happen on the way to an apology. Like you, I saw our university's December 2020 announcement about new evidence and continued research tying chattel slavery to our institution's abolish, abolitionist founder, Mr. Johns Hopkins. We even had pictures, Hopkins, the enslaved. And perhaps like some of you, I just assumed that some kind of apology was forthcoming. We'd seen apologetic statements come out of the University of Virginia, Georgetown and other schools, Yale just last month. Upon news, a flare of emails and emojis shot up among us history nerds. But mostly I went about my business the way much of Black Baltimore did with something of a group shoulder shrug, shrugging but nonetheless expecting. Expecting to be clear ain't the same thing as waiting for. To be clearer still, I place little stock in institutional mea culpas for reasons I'll get to in a bit. Suffice it to say, I wasn't the only person who suspected some kind of collective pronouncement of contrition might be on the way. Reportage and opinion pieces embracing the new evidence spoke frequently of the time and need for a racial reckoning. There were also contrary views in the wake of contrary research. These characterized the initial poignancy of university leadership as tantamount to an apology and perhaps the onset of a kind of schoolyard weakness. Quote, the university flinched, unquote. It's how one emeritus history professor put it. Even the document that deserves much credit for the fact of today's meeting the Seeking the Truth report by Sidney Van Morgan et al. situates its central claims in direct response to the revised university's messaging on Mr. Hopkins's life and times. Now, much of the ink spilled of late about Johns Hopkins and slavery purports to be about proper methods and exact terminology. It matters to us, I've learned, whether we call Mr. Hopkins a slave master, slave owner, slave trader, a holder of slaves, or merely the owner of a household with slaves in it. But one doesn't have to read very far into the debate over slavery and Hopkins, the did he or didn't he, to see that this isn't about slavery at all. To my reading, the deep apprehension shooting through the Hopkins slavery debate is about our ongoing Gilded Age search for moral benefactors and historically flawless philanthropists. Even more fundamentally, it's about whether Johns Hopkins University is good to and for black people. Both remain open questions or better ongoing questions. They can never be answered by an apology. 
Such questions, I argue, also make the debate around Hopkins, the man and the university, an expression of what W.E.B. Du Bois once called the propaganda of history. For my remarks today, I'd like to reframe the terms of the debate by reconsidering Du Bois and treating him as something of an unintended architect of what I'm calling for today's proceedings, a Hopkins historical method. Here is Dr. Du Bois at his home in Baltimore, 2302 Montebello Terrace, roughly four miles from the Homewood campus. He's already deep into his eventual 95 years of life and a corpus of more than 4,000 published pieces that included 16 books on sociology, history and politics, two autobiographies and three historical novels. Dr. Du Bois remains arguably the most prolific and impactful intellectual the United States has ever produced. In his magisterial 1935 book, Black Reconstruction, Du Bois used the propaganda of history concept in part to admonish Johns Hopkins University for a systematic exclusion of Negro students and for the role JHU's historians played in advancing the country's broad ignorance about black life and politics. I submit too, however, that Du Bois's perspective becomes critical in personal terms because he's the JHU affiliate that never was. Du Bois owned the house at Montebello Terrace more than 10 years. His daughter Yolanda taught at East Baltimore's Dunbar High School. But no evidence I've seen to date suggests that W.E.B. Du Bois ever stepped foot on the Hopkins campus. Du Bois's encounter with Hopkins affiliate, affiliates and his apparent lack of encounter stands in for the vast multitude of black people who have been diminished, excluded and disaffected by the racism of this university. His experience like that of the wider black Baltimore reminds us that a Hopkins historical method requires attending to those here present and embedded and to the distant and disaffected. Back in 1893, at the start of Du Bois' academic career, he's on a scholarship from the Slater Fund, a white philanthropy aimed at the descendants of slaves to pursue a PhD at the University of Berlin. In two years time, Du Bois writes a full doctoral thesis in German. The Slater Fund, however, refused to cover Du Bois' final semester of coursework. He subsequently forced to take his PhD at Harvard, an academic backwater compared to Berlin at the time. The president of the Slater Fund, Johns Hopkins University President Daniel Coit Gilman. Gilman stood impressed by all the positive testimonials the budding scholar had received from his professors at Berlin. But if the point was to prove the merits of the Negro, which for white donors was indeed the point, then Du Bois by Slater trustees estimation had already done that. Gilman congratulated Du Bois on his truncated success at Berlin and urged him, quote, upon returning to this country, devote your talent and your learning to the good of the colored race, unquote. Naturally, a position for Du Bois at Johns Hopkins was never entertained. We may never know the depth to which Du Bois blamed JHU's president for his aborted German doctorate. We do know that the year after Gilman and the Slater Fund Board denied Du Bois funding, Du Bois wrote a short story, his first. It's about a professor, a quote, sometime fellow at Johns Hopkins University, unquote, who blocks the appointment of a black faculty member from a fictional university. Now in the story, Du Bois saves his most acidic lines for university leaders who manipulated gilded age donor culture, quote, you can never give such devils credit for even their good deeds, but are always forced to look for the string to ferret out the scheme back of every wave of philanthropy." Unquote. Du Bois's opaque frustrations demand we embrace a historical method that can properly read Gilded Age race relations. We need to understand at minimum how the presence and later absence of federal protection and robust educational funding for Black people actually changed the material and discursive workings of racism. Reconstruction brought Black people political power and greater autonomy. The historian Allison Hobbs notes too, a downtick of African-Americans compelled to pass for white during these years. 
once Reconstruction ended, Black folk everywhere were left largely to the whims of white capital. Black self-determination was still a thing, certainly. Black pride and self-defense, very much a thing. Still, you can't explain the transactional racial politics of Booker T. Washington, or even the tone of the anti-lynching lynching crusade of Ida B. Wells, with its constant entreaties to British sympathizers, without understanding how, in the absence of militarized government protection, Black people courted white capital and pitched their arguments in a register consonant with white public opinion. I make this point about the world of Reconstruction to bring us back to our evolving understanding of Mr. Hopkins and slavery, and to do so through Du Bois's post-emancipation vantage point. Writing Black Reconstruction in 1935, Du Bois noticed among historians of slavery how declarations of impartiality actually bore profound political implications. Quote, our histories tend to discuss American slavery so impartially that in the end, end nobody seems to have done wrong. Everybody was right, unquote. For him, there was a morality to consider that we ought to consider beyond a compulsion to exonerate planters and planter adjacent individuals. It's fitting here to lean in a bit on the Morgan et al. report seeking the truth, given both its argument and the archival record as argument, its authors were kind enough to consolidate. Seeking the truth denies emphatically that Johns Hopkins, the man, ever owned slaves. It cites as evidence Quaker theology, tax records, census irregularities, and Black sentiment. The rich appendix of sources is actually more pages than the report itself. There's also a supplemental website with even more material. Among its most durable interventions, the report demolishes any future attempt to use this page from the 1850 census as visual shorthand to convey the contradiction of a flesh trading abolitionist, which again, the authors say Mr. Hopkins wasn't. But in its attempt to exonerate Mr. Hopkins, particularly through a massive document dump, the report may well have assured an interpretation many fans of the founder won't appreciate. If we take seriously, that Quakers took seriously, the 1821 discipline, the doctrine outlining that members of the faith never quote, the accessory to any step whereby human bondage may be continued, then Mr. Hopkins was at minimum a serially lapsed Quaker. We see how in 1831 and 1838, Johns understood how to utilize law enforcement to snatch and imprison enslaved people, quote, for safekeeping, unquote. We see that he knew how to leverage the equity in enslaved persons while avoiding ownership himself. We begin to appreciate why in 1850, Mr. Hopkins might remain quite at peace, subcontracting out slaving practices to those managing work at his Clifton estate. For students of religious history, these are fascinating dilemmas of Christianity and capitalism. Look, but don't touch. Touch, but don't taste. I imagine for Mr. Hopkins, the point wasn't so much the bondage or dehumanization part of all this, as it was the regular routine accounting of fungible labor and assets, and perhaps a clean conscience, as Dr. Turner had already alluded. Now, it's been hoped that Mr. Johns Hopkins be regarded still as a man ahead of his time. The evidence suggests that he was. He had learned, as his nation would eventually learn, how to skirt the moral outrages of slavery while preserving worker coercion and the profit margin. But allow me to make an even more Du Boisian move, stepping away from the great man and listening for the folk. What, for instance, was work like life like, like for Chloe Johnson or Jotsi, as a Black Baltimorean might pronounce it, as a census enumerator might transcribe it, pictured here, line two. J-O-T-S-Y, Johnson. She's saying one thing, he's writing another. Census records can indeed be troublesome things. They sometimes require hearing black voices speaking out loud. Listening for and outward from Chloe Johnson shows her in 1850 to be a 30 year old black woman and one of the few employees of Mr. Hopkins 
without the ability to read and write. In fact, of the two pages of the 1850 census included on the website supplementing the Seeking the Truth report, the only people who apparently can't read are Black and mulatto. Was the great benefactor's investment in Black education thus? Perhaps. It was certainly the result of deeper structures of white supremacy in and beyond Baltimore. Regardless, Chloe Johnson still worked for Mr. Hopkins when he died in 1873. And incidentally, the 1870 census lists her again and all Black occupants of the Hopkins home as unable to read or write. If we know nothing else, we know that Mr. Hopkins gave Miss Johnson $1,000 in his bequest, the equivalent of $24,000 for roughly a quarter century of work. We might also say with a great deal of certainty that none of us here would trade our own or our children's ability to read and write for $25,000. It's these kinds of trade-offs made under white whims that contribute to black experiences of, of exhaustion and disaffection. And we run the risk of missing the analytic power of such disaffection if we lean too heavily into conventional archives or fetishized documents, be they slick screenshots or hulking appendices. Over the last several years, I've interviewed scores of black staff, former black graduate students, past and present black faculty, and combed volumes and volumes of the JHU newsletter, the campus paper, all in an effort to document how even the most lofty intellectual agendas thrive on black disaffection and remain bound to institutional politics of desegregation. Conducting this research affirmed for me just how much and how little of the university's racial history makes it into the available documentary record. Consider this. A JHU newsletter keyword search for the word nigger yields hits for 61 separate editions of the paper. That's black and white in print between 1902 and 1991. That's at once a scandalous and a meaningless data point. For so much of the workings of racism remain bound to personal memories, traumas even, rarely reported, rarely even talked about, certainly not printed in the school newspaper. Who indeed are our 20th and 21st century Chloe Johnsons? Last month, I sat for a two hour interview with Adrienne Israel, the first black woman to graduate with a history PhD from Hopkins. She shared that upon her, uh, her return to Baltimore for a conference, she couldn't even drive onto the Hopkins campus. She got right outside the main entrance and couldn't physically turn the wheel. She hasn't been back since her dissertation defense in 1984. Such stories tell me that the archive for the future version of hard histories, some 50 years from now, should begin in the records of the Office for Institutional Equity. They should begin in the records of the EEOC. And even that won't be enough. It's incumbent on researchers, even archival researchers, to do the fieldwork that crosses yawning gaps of disaffection. Institutional histories must be written from their margins and often with considerable views from the outside. Founders, yo, whether we're talking about a project on 1619, 1776, or an 1872 donation, 73 donation by a Baltimore magnate, Imperfect founders raise questions about imperfect institutions, but we should never confuse institutions with individuals. If there's a flaw about which we should wring our hands, it's not the character flaw of morally imperfect Quaker capitalists or even the interpretive flaws hiding within our proclaimed concerns over best archival practices. The flaw lies most fundamentally in our compulsion to hang our sense of this university of our mission on the acts or intentions of a single man. Du Bois and the rest of historical Black Baltimore offer a way into a set of questions we should be thinking about, methodological and political. What's been the consequence of racism practiced by university affiliates? How have people fought to make Johns Hopkins University more just and democratic? How might we carry forward their example and how, regrettably, 
do we continue to miss out on the treasure of wisdom right under our noses due to our refusal to repair the damage we've already done? Rather than the search for perfect founders, we must pursue to research those life histories that fall between the cracks of our grand pronouncements. And we must do it without apology. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Connolly. Um, I think all three speakers have offered the treasure of wisdom. We have not a great deal of time, but probably about 10 minutes for discussion within the panel, and then we'll open it up to wider audience questions. Um, I am a historian of early America, so I'm very familiar with the issues of imperfect founders. Um, and it's something I think about a lot. And in fact, I just uh, finished teaching my undergraduate course in early American history this week. And I asked my students what they felt they had learned or that had surprised them about early America. And one of the students said that it was an uglier place than she had realized, but also a more interesting and nuanced place. And I think that willingness to confront the ugliness, to um, not to accept claims about mildness or about abolitionist self-congratulation um, are themes that have threaded through all of the talks today. Um, I think all of them following in a proud intellectual tradition of Du Bois and others, um, thinking about the folk as well as the sort of wider ideas. This is not a history that we can look back on and feel good about. It's just not possible. Um, but it's a difficult work to do. And I wonder, um, these thoughtful and eloquent panelists, if you might speak a bit about how you manage the confrontation with that ugliness, with the violence that you've outlined, um, the inequalities that persist for so long, and also sort of how you deal with the violence of the archives themselves and what is not included in them, the difficulties of getting to know a Chloe from a single line on a census record, um, and sort of how you have navigated those challenges. So perhaps we might start there. Which who would like to speak first? So, so I'll go ahead um, only because I'm, I'm most removed actually from um, the topic of slavery. I have, I have the benefit of, of having in many instances, much more documentary evidence than my colleagues on, on the panel around this kind of stuff. And, and, and I must say, um, I depended mightily on some of my 19th century colleagues, even just to help me decipher what I was looking at, because it, it, is, it is rarely that I work in manuscript collection. Um, but, but that being said, I mean, I, I think that there are definitely ways in which um, having colleagues and community and shared uh, projects that you're working on really does help you get through a certain kind of alienation. And again, just you know, disaffection and hurt that can come from kind of wallowing in very difficult material. Um, you know, as a historian of Jim Crow, you know, a lot of my stuff tends to revolve around violence with lynching and police and, you know, the, the, uh, the kind of sophist increasing sophistication of racial violence. But um, it also requires in some instances, and I think, you know, this, I try to allude to some of this, being in a position to recognize some of the continuities of that violence that are at work in our profession and in our institutions. And so for me, there, there's, a, there's a real value in understanding that the same kinds of problems and challenges, even if they're in a different form, that some of the, the forebears that we might study we're dealing with is actually also our job to, to deal with and alleviate. And we can fix some of that work as scholars did, like Williams and others, um, Du Bois, you know, and, and, and scores of, of folk, Ida B. Wells, and, and feel in some ways that we're not necessarily doing this on our own. And that there is, as you mentioned earlier in your opening remarks, Sarah, um, a, a tradition in which we're working and just having a sense of that, I think is, is very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Johnson or Turner, do you, you think? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, <clears throat> um, I can jump in and hopefully 
hear me okay. You know, I, it makes me think, I think we have a problem. Um, I, I think Dr. Connelly has laid out all the amazing ways, both in the presentation as well as in um, his remarks there about um, how um, working community is, is so important. Um, I think also though, we have in the, it comes to the history of slavery and history of early America, we do have a, a problem with who we put on pedestal um, and our unwillingness to confront certain myths. And I think that uh, I wanna thank Dr. Turner for her amazing um, breakdown of both the kind of mythography that attends um, the former slaveholding societies of the British empire, but also the kind of mythography that attends certain religious um, uh, denominations um, and abolitionist traditions, practices, etc. Um, and it, it, this is not unique to um, to this university, to all of the universities that are grappling with this question of slavery. I think are grappling with what it means in their mission and what it means about their founders and key personnel like Gilman. Um, I also think that we, you know, we do this with the founders, right? We um, there was a since um, Dr. Connolly brought up the 1619 project, um, there was a recent panel with Gordon Wood and Willie Holton on the 1619 project, among other things, um, at the uh, Massachusetts uh, Historical Society. Um, and at one point, you know, um, Wood challenges Holton and says that Jefferson never, you know, he didn't really want to exterminate um, Native Americans. And Holton says he literally said he wanted to exterminate Native Americans. Like, there is a way that our mythography around key historical figures somehow causes us to lose track of what is actually right in front of us. Um, and I think that the evidence can be complicated and the histories can be complicated. Um, but as somebody who scrapes the bottom of the barrel in the archive to get at just the semblance sometimes of what enslaved women and girls were experiencing, it is patently offensive, um, enraging, I, I believe, outraging was I think the word that Pennington said, to then be, to then have actual evidence um, and have that evidence then, you know, be, you know, somehow to, to be told that that evidence is not what that evidence is. And so I think there's two sides. One is where we see are mythic figures um, or figures that we've presumed to be mythic and mythic to who is always a great question. Um, when we see them on paper doing the ugly things that you know um, they are doing, we need to see that. And where we do not see enslaved women, for example, um, enslaved people, um, where the, uh, the lived experiences, the kinship networks are, um, um, do not appear. We actually also need to see, and if it's a place where we are going to, um, you know, draw gray conclusions about evidence, it should not be um, where, uh, because our, our you know, so-called um, founders in, in whatever way we describe them are doing something that we would rather not see, it should be in the realm of excavating black life and humanity, so. Thank you. Um, Dr. Turner, would you? Sure, um, I could just add a few things. Um, so I sometimes sort of get a little squeamish when we uh, sort of talk about the violence of the past, um, because sometimes it sort of assumes a discontinuity between the past and the present, which is that we, we've, we've been so far removed from that violence that the violence with which we're confronted in the archive, it's supposed to be shocking. Um, and in many respects, it's not. Um, there are different levels of violence, yes, between the 18th century world of slavery um, and the contemporary world in which we live. But if we play back any one of those clips um, from the murder of George Floyd, um, uh, we can sort of see that the presumption that we are living in a moment far removed from the violence of the past is, is really um, not quite true. Um, I think the other part of, of the, the sort of violence that I think of is the ways in which sometimes the assumptions that we make about what kinds of violence exist, um, it goes beyond the physical. Um, one of the, the, the sort of uh, 
points of my own work is to think through the ways in which enslaved women, for example, were incentivized um, to bear children. And we don't think of, you know, incentivized women to bear children in violent terms, but these are, you know, pretty violent terms, right? Um, so the, the very terms, the very way in which we're conceptualizing um, violence, we're conceptualizing the treatment of uh, Black people's past and present, we also need to update um, those terms. Um, that said, um, you know, the archive is, is, is a ticklish place for us historians working on the 18th and 19th century. We all uh, know very well just how fragmentary the evidence um, actually is um, and how much we sort of have to work in piecing together uh, from the very little that's there. And part of the historical methodology has to be in conversation uh, with the fragment, which is we cannot sort of present perfect histories. We cannot pretend as if we're, we're, we're presenting whole histories. The conversation has to also include the nature of the archive, the violent nature of the archive to sort of pull in um, another recent work done uh, by Marisa Fuentes, which sort of shows us that the very discipline of history itself um, is quite a, a violent endeavor. So I think part of our conversation um, has to also shift with the kinds of terms uh, of the debate, of the discussion, and the ways in which the discipline in which we're engaged in that privileges uh, certain methodologies of knowing in and of itself also reproduces um, the, the violence of the past. Thank you so much. Um, we have limited time and we have a lot of questions. Um, I am going to start with sort of um, some of the wider, those with kind of a wider implication or take up. Um, one question is, what advice might you panelists offer to other university communities engaging in this research? And what do these reflections and archival discoveries offer for the future as a kind of linked pair of questions? think. Okay, I'll go again. Um, so um, what, one of the things um, that it's been really um, incredible about this moment on the university's campus is just the range um, and depth of historical research being done on the university's history. So um, uh, Dean Chalenza had mentioned already, naturally, um, Hopkins retrospective, as well as um, you know, hard histories and, and the massive contributions there. Um, there's also uh, seven different research clusters that are working out of um, our program in racism, immigration, citizenship, um, as well as work that's being done through the Billy Holiday uh, Institute as well on campus, Billy Holiday Project for Liberation Arts. And all of these have different methodological elements to them. And so I think part of what is actually essential um, is having people who understand folklore, who understand anthropology, who understand how to do big data work. And there's there so many different new ways to mine the history of the university and how it shows up. Archaeology is not off the table, right? I mean, they, they, we, we have to begin to get very ecumenical um, and really encourage our various university leaderships and the foundations to get um, you know, very forward thinking in the kinds of work that they support. The other thing I'll, I'll say about this only very briefly is that um, it, it is not beyond the realm to consider that we do need to think about how to organize the political power of universities to secure greater federal funding for these kinds of projects and other kinds of redressive policies and programs that would allow universities to be more ambitious in their dealings with marginal populations and the kind of intellectual work those populations can do. Very, very, very shortly, in the 1970s, we as an institution, Johns Hopkins, hired its first Black faculty members, brought in its first Black doctoral students, had the first introduction of women's studies and Black studies on campus because the federal government was in a much stronger position to basically seize resources from universities that weren't showing breakthroughs in bringing this kind of difference to their campuses. And we've basically now been subject to a kind of gilded age context like the late 19th century where all of this is kind of voluntary and philanthropic. And so really understanding how we got to the point where these first investments in bottom-up work were being done, 
it was being done with the, the federal government literally looking over our shoulders during the second reconstruction. And so we should not be averse in all the ways that universities show up and express themselves politically, whether it's in the defense sector, in the health sector or otherwise, we should also show up politically in these ways as well because it will pay very strong and long-term dividends in the kinds of work that we'll be able to run from our various intellectual shops. Thank you. Um, we have another question which asks for the past um, 75 years, Johns Hopkins history faculty and PhDs have written a great deal about slavery and race. How might we assess the achievements and limitations of their methods, evidence, and conclusions? Have these methods evolved over time? Do we see new methods or evidence deployed by your own PhD students? Um, so I'll, I'll go first this time. Um, well, yeah. Um, so, you know, sort of, I want to respond to the earlier question um, and sort of loop it into to this one here, um, which is picking up on, you know, two points, one that I raised and one uh, from Dr. Connolly, which is one, who gets to frame the conversation? Um, who gets to frame the terms of the debate? And are we sort of including those on the margins in the conversation? Uh, because if we think, for example, about the, how abolition itself unfolded and how the post-emancipation period unfolds in places like Jamaica, what you have occurring uh, is essentially uh, a, re a reproduction of the relations of slavery under the guise of freedom and emancipation. And part of that has to do with the fact that the abolitionists who were framing uh, the terms of freedom, they were framing the terms of freedom in keeping with the prosperity of the empire. Uh, black freedom, what did black people want was not at the forefront of the debate. If we think about the long struggle for abolition, the long struggle for emancipation, we know that from the moment um, people of African descent were enslaved, they they were always calling for freedom. But it, when we think about abolition, uh, their voices get marginalized, their voices are lar largely stifled. And I think that fits into the second question, which is uh, the, the kinds of methodologies that are needed to get to those voices. One of the, the, the questions that people like to ask of the kinds of work that we do is where do you find the sources? And it's the same sources that we're all using. But when we democratize history departments where we have uh, individuals who ask different kinds of question of the same sources, then the kinds of answers generated are bound to be different. A case in point, again, is the subject of abolitionism, where those who are part of the empire, those who are invested in the working of the empire and the subsequent historians, they told a very different story, a story that celebrates Celebrated, um, you know, uh, British moral goodness in ending slavery. But the moment you had uh, scholars from the Caribbean, like Eric Williams, that I talked about who understood that there was a very, uh, there was a difference between uh, what the Imperial Center said and what it actually did. They understood that the kinds of questions that you take to the sources are going to yield a very, very different set of responses. So if we look to the research that has been coming out um, really since the 1950s and 1960s, that, sort of, that coincides uh, both with the independence and uh, decolonial movements of the Caribbean that uh, coincide with the Black Power Movement, the Civil Rights Movement, uh, the Women's Rights Movement um, of the, the, the decades of the, the 20th century. And today, the sort of shift in politics as well uh, over how we think about gender in the archive, the kinds of questions are different. And this is what we get when we democratize history departments, where it's not the old white boys who are asking the same questions, but the people who are asking the questions are, are actually different. They're actually essentially coming from the margins. And that's where we get to really get to see a different perspective of history. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything the other panelists would like to add to that? Um, we have a deceptively- um, I think I will. Oh, you will, okay. No, 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 please, go. I, I can always go ahead. Hold it. Um, so we have, I, I think what'll probably unfortunately have to be our last question. Um, which is deceptively short and simple, but actually quite significant, which is um, why does knowing 
about these histories matter. So since I said I would fold this into the, <laughs> the next question, I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, I, 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 I'm going to say a statement that I think sort of captures my responses to each of these questions, which are, which are amazing questions. Thank you, audience, and engaging, um, which is that universities need to support their, um, their Black faculty, their black students, graduate students, their undergraduate students. And I mean black in the broad sense. I'm, you know, I'm diasporic, diasporic and pan-Africanist. So I don't mean solely African Americans. I mean across um, those of African descent, African inclusive. Um, and I think that gets at a lot of um, a lot of these points in this question. So why do we need to know this history, not just um, which I take as to be a history not just of the university, but a history of slavery in Baltimore, a history of slavery in the household, a history of slavery in abolition. Um, because we actually need to understand more than ever um, how this history, how these inequities um, have shaped relations, social, political, economic relations, religious relations, um, and institutional institutions and institution building in the present day. There is a reason why um, more Black people at one point were dying um, of COVID and COVID complications. There is a reason why um, there are certain neighborhoods in Baltimore that have um, more access to clinics, more access to services, um, get the trash picked up faster. These are these are facts, and these these are data points um, that have been discussed, debated, brought to the fore by Baltimore organizers of all races, but especially Black Baltimore broadly. Um, and those things have histories, and those histories don't start with the civil rights movement, and they don't start with the Great Migration. They are deeply rooted in inequities that stem from slavery, that, as um, Dr. Turner and Dr. Connolly related, are part of how a Hopkins family or a Carroll family, um, or these other names um, have the wealth that they have and how this institution has the wealth that it's able to pull from um, and how Black Baltimoreans and Black folks broadly across the US do not. Um, and so this is why we need to, we need to know, th know this history. But we also need to know because we need to understand um, what are the ways that we can chart a better future. Like that's that in a lot of ways, this is about understanding you know, very basic Sankofa principles, understanding where we've been in order to get um, to create a different um, future. Um, and this is why not retreading the same ground of mythographies um, and obfuscation is critically, critically, critically important. Um, and our universities need to play a really significant role in that because this is the time when these histories and education on these subjects is under full frontal assault. And our universities need to be at the front of not only fighting that, but also protecting those of us who are also on the front line. Thank you so much. I think that seems like an appropriate place to end. And unfortunately, this is our time. It is an honor to be um, on this panel. Wonderful to hear about this work. Um, I know we'll be hearing more from others, including Martha Jones, about um, the continued kind of work that's going on here at Hopkins and elsewhere. Um, and I thank you all for wonderful contributions. Thank the audience. I'm sorry to those of you whose questions I could not get to, but the afternoon is only just beginning. So hopefully there'll be other opportunities. Thank you so much. <laughs>